Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's panel discussion. My name is Adrian Deliger, and I'm honored to be your host for a conversation entitled Opportunities in Gamifying Nature Conservation, the second in a series from the collaboration between the Luke Hoffman Institute and the Internet of Elephants. Many of you have been following and even participating in the journey of this collaboration in which we're trying to unlock new sources of revenue for the conservation of wildlife, looking into gamification specifically as a means to add value to wildlife data. Thank you for your engagement, your ideas and inputs to date, and thank you for being here today. To understand the opportunities, potential pitfalls and the current landscape, we commissioned research by gamification experts Pentequest. This work was also co-authored by someone in the Luke Hoffman Institute team, Sasha Seabright, who is in a placement from the University of Cambridge. The full report is available on our website, and I believe you've either seen it by now or are quite able to find it yourself, but for your convenience, we'll put it, uh, a link in the chat box as well. Today, we're joined by Sasha, as well as Alex Jackson, the gamification expert who led the research on this report from Pentequest side. We did not want a show uh, presentations and PowerPoints. We wanted to stick to the dynamic format that we had last time. So Sasha and Alex are joining us in a panel discussion. My first few questions will focus on the report's findings. I will then turn to Alfie Rustam and Louisa Richmond Kogan to give their perspective. Alfie is an experienced storyteller and a practitioner of gamification, bubbling with projects and ideas. Louisa is deeply versed in conservation and can help ensure that what we're talking about actually helps on the ground efforts. So we're thrilled to have you panelists and participants. But before we start, I wanted to let you know of how we plan to run this session. First, the panel discussion is being recorded. We plan to put it up online on the Luke Hoffman Institute websites within the next few days. This only concerns the panelists. As a participant, you're not filmed, you're not heard, and nothing you put in the chat box will obviously be put uh, next to this, this uh, YouTube. But I thought I'd say that. We want this to be interactive, so please engage in the chat box, engage each other directly, engage the panelists. Um, please note that there are two options. Uh, you can either uh, uh, chat to the host and panelists or to everybody, so I encourage you to, to make sure that you're talking to everybody if, if that's what you want to do. Please also use the chat box to send uh, information about your personal project, your LinkedIn profile, your Twitter handle. The point is that we want people to create new connections, have new ideas and new perspectives on issues. So really feel free to, to use that chat box and we have a team that will be monitoring it closely. We will publish also quick polls during the panel, which you can respond to. These are designed to be fun. We just wanted to play a few games with you. They're not extremely serious, but they may also provide some insight to our team. So just don't be surprised as you see these uh, pop up. I will moderate uh, the initial round of discussions with prepared, with prepared questions that I have. Um, but if you have got questions and the, and the chat box gets kind of fired up, I'll gently transition to questions from the audience. There's a team working behind the scene that will select some of them, relay them to me, and I will ask them. After an hour or just short of an hour, the official part of the panel will be finished. Um, we will stop recording the video and we will say goodbye. However, the panelists have kindly agreed to stay an extra half hour. The reason we're doing this is we wanted to be able to have greater interaction between participants and panelists and between participants and other participants. So we're experimenting with this feature. We've never done this before. Uh, be patient with us. Uh, we know that there's a lot of people interested in, in speaking to this topic, so we won't be able to have everybody on stage because it'll be too crowded. But we also wanted to mimic a little bit of, of real life and uh, opportunities for, for, discussing, uh, for discussing beyond just uh, Zoom. So there you go. Um, it's time I now turn to our panel that have been sitting patiently as I went off. First off, Alex Jackson is a gamification designer and a project, ma project manager at Pentequest and co-author of the report we'll be discussing today. He is based in Canberra, so thank you very much for staying up so late. I think it's past um, 11 o'clock where you are. I'm not sure I could do that, so um, thank you for being with us. Sasha Seabright is an MPhil candidate at the University of Cambridge, where her thesis examined the potential unintended adverse consequences of gamifying nature conservation. She's been a key part of the Institute's gamification project to date, and she's the co-author of the report we're discussing today. Alfie Rustin is the CEO and founder of Defend Nature Interactive, a purpose-driven entertainment studio dedicated to tackling our greatest problems through interactive media and NFTs. 
Their first game, Bioman's Forest Farm, is a novel farming simulation that empowers players to take constructive action against climate change, both in digital and real life. Alfie is based in Los Angeles, where he's setting up the Bioman TV series. So for Alfie, it's very early, and you may notice that the light will go increasingly as the sun rises uh, in Los Angeles. Dr. Louisa Richmond Kogan is the Dean at the Africa Leadership University School of Wildlife Conservation, which aims to grow the next generation of African conservation entrepreneurs and leaders. She is a conservation scientist with 20 years of experience, both in the field-based research programs across Africa and as a part of international NGOs. Thank you all very much for being here today. My first round of questions focusing on the report is for Alex. So Alex, you work for a gamification company and you've been exposed to all different forms of its use in various sectors. This report shows unsurprisingly just how ubiquitous gamification is or has become in our daily lives. And the report shows plenty of examples. But in your research, did you find concrete examples in the conservation sector and ideally some that are um, working? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Adrian. Um, look, gamification is all around us. Whether we're, we're scanning our credit card for those extra points, redeeming some sort of uh, loyalty, they're, they're using gamification. It's, it's using gamification, essentially. Now, at, at its essence, we're looking at behavioral psychology. We're trying to motivate user behavior um, at its core. And yes, we absolutely, we did find some, some really wonderful examples. This is not the, the one and only list, and I'll just touch on a couple in a second, but uh, it's just important to understand that these are some of the things that we came across. Now, they're also at different stages. Some were, were in a trial phase, some were um, a bit more further down the line, but all of them have some really interesting things that we can learn from them uh, and, and take away and apply, I suppose, in, in future efforts. Um, and one of the first ones that came uh, to mind for, for me was key conservation. Now, key conservation is quite a new um, platform, but it's essentially about bringing people together, creating a community. And that's something that uh, I'm really interested in touching on a bit later in the conversation. And I'm, I'm excited to explore that in further detail. But it's, it's an application that brings together volunteers, um, do donors, professionals and experts in their field and essentially allows them to localize their efforts. So via a, a, live, a live feed. Now that's really important when we're looking at uh, making sure that conservation efforts go where they're, they're actually needed. And this was a really key example of something that had real potential. Now, again, this was really, really early stages and um, I had the pleasure of, of talking to a couple of the people involved in, in that project, um, but, but something that really stood out. Another one, uh, we actually had the pleasure of interviewing um, so some of the guys from this uh, Perfect, Perfect Earth. Now, Perfect Earth is very much like a Pokemon Go type example, which is very often referred to when we're talking about gamification. Um, but it's about heading out into nature, into wildlife reserves and looking for um, virtual animals and picking them up and learning about those, those species that we can pick up. Um, the difference is it's a much more controlled environment. So the, the nature reserves, they're kind of picked out to ensure that there's not as many safety concerns as something, again, like we might have seen with, with Pokemon Go or, or other examples that are a bit more open sourced. Um, now, Perfect Earth also have magazines and various other elements are part of that. So they're not just limited to the application that they have. So again, a really interesting example of, of a company that's not taking just one approach, but, but multiple. Um, Samsung Wildlife Watch was another really key one that came, came to mind and was quite special for me because uh, you know, sitting here in Australia, I was able to tune in and watch a live video stream of animals in wild in Africa. And that, that's a really amazing concept, I think. But Samsung Wildlife Watch did some really cool stuff with that. And they were looking at how they can use that to reduce poaching or illegal wildlife activity. Now, when I tune in, the Samsung Wildlife uh, essentially partnered with Africam. Africam, you can, you can log on. Um, they've got a subscription type service and you're able to go in and, and see these, these nature reserves, uh, these watering holes where there's lions and zebras coming in and, and feeding. And yeah, it's, it's just truly a, quite a, a really wonderful experience. Now, Samsung Wildlife Watch partnered with these guys and transformed this into a way to, for, for people like myself to log on and look out for illegal activity and report that if it happens. 
which is a, a wonderful concept. Again, this was something that was still early on in, in stages and they're looking at trials and, and doing more with it. So what's yet to come is, is unknown, but from what we saw, it's some quite interesting concepts there. Um, another really interesting one was using artificial intelligence for something called Name That Fish. I thought it was quite a, a wonderful thing, very small company still, but uh, very interesting applications. And what happens is uh, the, the recorded image of, let's say, an aquarium, or if you're out diving and you take footage of um, a group of fish, it runs it through an artificial intelligence to actually label those species. Now, that's a really interesting example. If we are walking through a zoo or an aquarium and all of a sudden, you know, I, as, as a, as a um, as a visitor of an aquarium, I can go up and I can look at the fish and rather than trying to look at those little labels on the side and, and, and try to match up which is which, perhaps if there was a screen there that shows us exactly what those fish are and it kind of highlights the different species, which is really fascinating. Um, and then the last one I wanted to highlight was uh, Alfie's Bioman. So I'm, I'm literally gonna leave it there and let, let the man himself speak to it. But, we, we had the opportunity to talk to a lot of wonderful people, um, Louisa and, and Alfie on, on the panel here being two of those people. So really wonderful. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to the conversation. Thank you so much. That was, that was really great. Some great examples. And I see in the, the chat box also that Christian is, is here. So maybe in that second, uh, if he's still here in, in an hour, maybe we'll have an opportunity to, to jump in on, on the screen as well. Over to Sasha. Um, I've known you since the beginning of the project and even a little bit before. One of the starting premises of this project that you've been involved in is that conservation funding can be revolutionized. These are some of the words that we've been using uh, through using games and gamification. In part, this is about storytelling and reconnecting. And you wrote a thought piece about that uh, with us. Um, in part, it's about nudging behavior. After studying this in depth, so it's been a few months and you've, you've written a thesis and this report uh, on this topic, what are your feelings now about, the, about this premise? Can games revolutionize conservation? It's a big question. <laughs> Thanks for that, Adrian. So I'll start with the fact you mentioned storytelling and reconnection. So this project has particularly been uh, investigating how to make wildlife data the item of value being bought and sold in what we've been calling the conservation marketplace. So this data, such as location, behavioral information, it's already being collected around the world every day by researchers. And if we could use that to bring real animals environments to life for people, like what Alex was saying about Samson Wildlife Watch, you can really kind of connect people, even if they're very far apart to that nature. And that's got to be a step forward. So um, one of the members of Internet of Elephants, actually Raf, wrote a piece recently on that. So I think if someone else doesn't link to it, I'll link to it later, on how wildlife data can um, help engage audiences with emotive stories and, and those along those lines. Um, and along a similar thread, the younger generation is what we've been calling and what are digital natives. Um, and since day one, they are globally connected, totally immersed in a world dominated by social media. So if we're to engage this developing generation, we absolutely need to connect with them on their turf in a way that works with them. And that's why I think gamification could be really key in that. Um, in my opinion, there's multiple steps needed to make that a global reality, but I do think it is still possible, definitely possible. <laughs> um, something I've thought a lot about is the fact that we have to distinguish between, and I hate using this, but a fad, which is awesome in its own right. It brings money into the sector. So that could be an engaging game, for example. But we've got to distinguish between that and something that is truly revolutionary, um, that really changes the way that conservation is funded. Um, so gamification elements, I think without doubt, can assist with making that a reality. But I think nothing to date has quite nailed doing it, um, or at least there's a, a lot of untapped potential there. So. I think definitely worth still looking into, but much stronger focus needs to be in the sector as a whole on user needs and user desires, what makes them tick, how to get them to want to change the way they do things long term. Um, that's a very long way of saying yes, <laughs> but I think that... Um, that's <laughs> Great, that was that was very insightful, and I, I'm I'm a big fan of the topic of of younger generations user needs. So, we'll get back to that um, a bit later. I think back to Alex. Um, you outlined some examples. I hope it's not 
too much to ask. I, I, I'm also bouncing off what Sasha was talking about funding. Um, do you, did your research outline any good examples of, of, of raising funds? And maybe some of the ones that you talked about there actually were geared for that. But there's a lot of examples that I hear and, and, and that you mentioned as well are about awareness raising, which is obviously incredibly important, or even behavioral change. Um, but are there examples out there uh, of gamification or games increasing funding? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a really interesting conversation that that we engage with th throughout writing this report, and I'm going to refer back to Pokemon Go. It's always a really interesting example when we're when we're talking about um, gamification specifically. Now, this example over about a five year period um, raised about five five million dollars. Right? There's there's been a few studies that looked into its effectiveness and all these many interesting things. Now. When we compare that to the finance gap in nature conservation, we're looking at a, a $900 billion gap. Now, five, five billion versus 900 is, is just such a ginormous gap. Now, how can something so successful as, as, as successful as Pokemon Go produce a mere five? How, how are we supposed to fill that gap? And that's the question that we, we looked into uh, exploring. And, and quite honestly, there's, there's a lot of different applications that have brought in funding, absolutely. But again, nothing quite close to that, that massive gap uh, that we're trying to fill. Now, this is where we came across this, this other concept of community of an alliance of a collective uh, that I mentioned earlier. And I think this is something that we've kind of tagged onto. And I really hope to see this progress uh, along the years and potentially provide a solution to filling that gap. Now, an example that I want to refer to is the Playing for the Planet Alliance. So this came out of uh, the, the UN in 2019. And so very quite, quite fresh. But what it is, is a collection of gaming studios who have done a collective agreement and commitment to um, addressing the, the, what, the issue that we have with our environment across the world. And this collective now includes, it didn't at the beginning, but now includes the likes of Microsoft and Sony. And what they've committed to doing is, is incorporating green nudges into their games, um, commitments the for, for the studios themselves to make changes that are gonna help benefit the environment. Now, one of the biggest things that I wanna highlight with, with this collective, they, uh, I, th I think their report last year highlighted 32 studios um, that are now a part of this alliance they ran a, a green game jam. And it was a, a way to essentially over a period of time. Now, unfortunately, COVID did throw a little bit of a spanner in the works as it had for, for many things. But what they did was they had a reach of, of over a billion people. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a massive, massive amount of people. And when we're talking about green nudges, it, it might not be directly funding, but it's perhaps it's changing the behavior of the, the players, that 1 billion players or more in their home environment. And if we can make change at that scale, that's quite significant. Now, that's, that's one way, but they also did uh, incorporate funding models into that and, um, and packages that players could purchase that goes towards direct funding, uh, directly funding conservation efforts. Now, I don't have the figures, unfortunately. I know that would have been uh, really wonderful, but... Uh, <laughs> There, I think this is something that potentially could really lead down a, a, an interesting path to solving that, that $900 billion gap that otherwise I, I, I don't know how we can get that with any one campaign or something like that. Mm. Sorry, very helpful. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> I could see, uh, thanks for the cue, Sasha. Um, the question was for you, actually. Uh, uh, last question for uh, about specifically the report before I move on. But importantly, um, Sasha, you've also focused on the potential uh, unintended adverse consequences of gamification, demotivation of positive behavior or other things. Um, can you give us some examples of this? Are these concerns valid? I'm sure they are. Uh, are they a showstopper on the other hand? So you know how I love talking about this. <laughs> I could go on for it, so please stop me if I ramble. But yeah, gamification is at its essence a behavior change and motivation. 
So that does mean that any um, gamified systems need to be very carefully designed and monitored to ensure they elicit the correct or desired behaviors rather than correct. And don't cause the opposite effects because that is entirely possible and, and has occurred in the past. Um, an example could be if the gamified system tries to use negative emotions such as guilt to kind of elicit certain reactions, then the uh, user might rebel against the system. And that's exactly what we don't want to have. So you also mentioned demotivation. Um, and the topic of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivations is a pretty big one in gamification. Because um, gamification systems, generally speaking, rely on influencing extrinsic motivations, um, virtual badges, points to symbolize progress, um, loyalty programs, gifts, rewards, those kind of things. Um, and there has been research to, well, it's not necessarily shown, there's a bit of contention on this, but it's looking into whether if you replace um, those intrinsic motivations in people that are already intrinsically motivated with those external rewards and then remove those rewards, whether they basically their ultimate intrinsic motivation is reduced long term. And that's something we really don't want to happen in conservation. Um, definitely not. <laughs> um, and then there's also um, there's a lot of other risks. But I mean, with any intervention, there's, there's risks identified. Um, so particular to this project, the use of wildlife data, um, a big one is hackers and cyber poachers is this new terminology that's been used. Um, there's already been documented attempts of cyber poachers trying to hack into wildlife tracking data. Um, and if you obtain that real time geospatial data, that will lead you directly to a tagged animal, um, which, as you can imagine, has pretty horrendous consequences. Um, I'm not sure whether the examples I've seen, they were thwarted in their attempts. I'm not sure whether that has actually come to pass, but it's definitely something that we need to look into more. Um, and it could also happen if the gamification practitioners don't use that real-time data in an appropriate manner. If they're trying to engage people and try and use that real-time data to really draw people in, then people can obviously have access to that data and use it for negative reasons. I think it was actually Louisa who spoke about this in depth during one of our previous conversations. Um, so that might be something that Louisa might want to draw on more. Um, regarding it being a deal breaker or not, uh, <laughs> uh, personally, I do lean towards risk being more risk averse in myself, but I've had some very insightful conversations <laughs> during the past year and I think the main thing I've realized is that the worst thing we can do is nothing at all. I think we've spoken about that before, Adrian. I think for conservation perspectives, we can't stand still. We have to do new things. So, yeah, doing nothing at all isn't an option. Um, it's certainly worth taking the time to understand those risks because there will be things we need to mitigate against, such as cyber poaching in this example. Um, and there will always be risks to any intervention. So the fact that we brought these to light in this project just means that we can help mitigate against them. Um, doesn't mean that there's more risks for this than there is for anything else. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. It does, thank you very much, very helpful. I'm gonna turn now to Alfie. Um, Defend Nature Interactive um, relies on blockchain and NFT so far as I understand it. My question is why? Can you tell us a little bit about non-fungible tokens maybe some in our audience uh don't know about it so it's this explain it to me like i'm five kind of a thing um, blockchain and its potential role for the future of conservation absolutely okay so a little uh, class on nfts then um so thank you so much for hosting this this has been tremendous even just listening to uh, uh sasha and alex has been insightful and i've been uh, taking some notes about uh, how, how to leverage some of the insights they've been sharing and it's been a fantastic report and I want to read it again and again because there's a there's a lot of good uh, information in there so uh, good job guys um, I really appreciate the insights there and uh, hopefully we can build a community around this because I think it's a super important topic and I think it's, it's a great great opportunity uh, to uh, leverage some of the new technologies that are coming out that gamers are now starting to use and NFTs, non-fungible tokens is one of those uh, new technologies that are available now to gamers and other people to 
uh, do some really cool things with and raising money is one of them. So a non-fungible token is just a, if you've heard of the blockchain, uh, the, these tokens live on the blockchain and they basically give you access to a, a, a digital asset. So it's a, it proves provenance to a particular digital asset. And so um, these were uh, now coming into the mainstream because of these uh, uh, digital artwork. And so you have digital artwork living on the blockchain. The blockchain is, uh, you can't hack it. It, it uh, proves provenance. So you know what you're getting is gonna be real. So you now have these uh, digital artworks living on the blockchain and they're, the NFT is a way of accessing that digital artwork. So if you own the NFT, it means you own the digital artwork and there's no way if it's in your, if that, and people have these, what they call digital wallets. So that uh, 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 digital asset uh, lives in your digital wa wallet. And it, you know, there's various ways of putting the artwork online, but ba basically that's it. I don't know if that makes sense. This is all very, you know, it's- No, it's, it's, it's a complicated topic. I think you're doing, you're doing very well. <laughs> okay, good. But basically it's a way of, of attaching a digital asset to a token and that token proves ownership of that digital asset and you can transfer it either by gifting it or you know using money and that money can be fiat currency you know us dollars gbp or it can be uh, uh, other cryptocurrencies and a lot of this activity is done through uh, uh, cryptocurrency and what's happening is that you have these uh, uh, people making a lot of money now because of uh, the, the you know, Bitcoin a couple of years ago was worth you know five thousand dollars now it's fifty thousand Ethereum similar so you're having this great a, a tremendous amount of wealth being created within the crypto community and they're keeping it within the they want to keep it within the uh, crypto ecosystem so what they're doing now is taking their wealth from the uh, Ethereum Bitcoin and then they're plowing it back into the, these NFTs so you have this huge influx of wealth now flowing into uh, the NFT world. So hopefully that explains some of the context around uh, NFTs. It does. So Defend Nature Interactive is, is, is trying to leverage that for conservation. I'm starting to yeah. see something, digital assets, conservation, lots of money. So, so what, 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 yeah. what is the solution there? What it, well, it's a, one of the solutions we're working on is basically the, these NFTs, uh, because they're programmable as well, they're these things called smart contracts that they're part of. These smart contracts are programmable. So you can actually programming rules around how the um, uh, NFT behaves. So for example, one of the rules that we're playing with is that, hey, if there's a resale in the NFT, there's a royalty component to that. So you buy it for uh, $10, you sell it for $20, what happens with that uh, $10 uh, profit, you know? And so royalties is a part of it. So say 5% of that can be designated as a royalty that goes to the original creator of the NFT. And so now it becomes a way of creating recurring revenue. If you're, you know, back in the day, or well, still now, if you're an artist, you're, you know, you're, with a physical art, you sell the artwork, you don't have any exposure to the upside of that. But NFTs allow you to have exposure to the upside through royalties. And so you can do uh, transactions of value of this NFT is going up. A piece of that royalty then goes to wherever you want it to. And so what we're doing is offering the, uh, the community is to um, uh, designate their royalties to go towards their favorite NGO, whether it be conservation or, or um, um, otherwise. So it allows uh, uh, more philanthropic purchases of these NFTs to assign their royalties to uh, a, a organization. The, the beauty of this is, is that it's on the blockchain and it's, it's in perpetuity. So these royalties will, uh, uh, you know, I, I call it perpetual philanthropy. So it really allows uh, uh, people to, even when, you know, they've passed and gone on, their NFT is still accruing value. Now, the trick is obviously having an NFT that's going to uh, uh, accrue in value and so those royalties are actually a positive number rather than zero and that's the trick right it's how do you create an nft that is going to accrue in value and that's where i think games come in because uh, the, the reason why nfts become more valuable is because more people want that nft there's a limited scarce supply you get you get a lot of people wanting wanting something in it that's in scarce uh, supply the demand uh, drives up the Price, right, so so we're we're creating NFTs that uh, using games uh, uh, will increase the values of value of the NFT and in, uh, hopefully create uh, 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 significant uh, royalties for uh, NGOs and conservation charities. 
Great, thank you. That's very helpful and hopefully encouraging. Um, we have plenty of questions coming up on, on this. Um, I suspect it'll feature in the in the last informal 30 minutes, but let's let's keep on plowing through for now. Um, Luisa, I'm also using you a little bit to, 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 to wrap things up in this in this debate. Um, you've got a rich career both in the field and in the research world and applied research, practical research, and strong credentials when it comes to conservation data, which is a, an important part of, of what we're looking at. In your perspectives, can gains in gamification help fill a gap and benefit conservation and conservation? So the question is really how can data uh, improve the situation on the ground rather than just you know, help us uh, feel good about collecting more data? Thanks, Adrian. This is an absolutely critical question, and it's one that is fundamental to uh, conservation now and very much in the future. So as Alex was saying, that there is a fundamental funding gap in conservation. I think the number you put into your report was up to 824 billion US dollars by 2023, which is really nine years away. So how do we uh, fill that gap? As Alex was saying, it's, it's critically important because funding drives all of the conservation efforts that we have to undertake uh, across the globe. Um, and without that uh, funding, we cannot do the activities that are, are essential um, to ensure the long-term security and viability of our ecosystems um, for the health and well-being of our planet and the people who live here. Um, also, in terms of how can uh, conservation benefit from gamification, as Alex and Sasha was both saying, an increase in awareness of the issues and the critical challenges that we have across the natural world, and how uh, can people and individuals see themselves within those challenges and ensure that they feel connected to those challenges. And so gamification, I believe, will open up an entirely new audience. Um, we as conservationists, we work within a certain sphere, we really try and get our message out to a broad audience and sometimes that is a challenge. Um, and sometimes we do um, get siloed um, with our communication and we keep repeating and reconnecting with the same audience, particularly around donations and requests for funding. Um, and so someone who may be using a game would be completely new to wildlife, to conservation, to the value of nature. They may not have thought about donating or supporting an environmental or conservation organization. And this really reaches out um, to a, a diversified and global audience, which is fundamentally what we need, um, because that will then drive the level of income um, that we need because it's um, a global market we can attract rather than uh, a small proportion of those who are really uh, already connected um, to wildlife and nature. And then as Sasha talked about, uh, changing, changing behavior. Um, so fundamentally um, in the report, it says that it's really important that gamification looks at both virtual and real world um, causes and experiences. So not to lose that connection to nature and wildlife, to have both the virtual and real world connected. And Alex has given some great examples of that. And I, I fundamentally um, feel that that is the direction to go um, because again, it brings an audience that may not have um, being interactive with nature from a gamification side that then moves them through um, to uh, support local or national or international causes and even to um, undertake uh, activities on the ground to support local community based initiatives or, or work even in local government or policy to create environmental change um, within their government and, and local council even. So in terms of the role of data, um, fundamentally that is in two parts. One, we need data to drive policy change. Um, data is the foundation to all management decisions. Without it, we can't put forward a strong, well-organized and direct argument. Um, and we need that to ensure that we're able to do change policy and legislation, both at the national and international level. So data is fundamental to that and then governments as well they work off facts and figures that can be reported discussed shared um, it is a uh, language that goes across different stakeholder groups that they can look at the report and go these are the recommendations from this data um, and then these are the the changes and practical um, management decisions that we're going to take from the information that you have provided so it ensures transparency um, within the decision making process that it is there's a clearly defined data set upon which decisions um, are being undertaken. And then the secondary piece is that data enables us to understand the status 
or health of systems and species. Uh, and this as conservationists is fundamental to us. It helps us uh, to understand complex systems um, to ensure our measures are actually creating the change that we are looking for, that they're not um, even detrimental, that they're having positive um, direct change on the challenges um, and um, issues that we are looking um, to resolve. Uh, we can also compare one data set to another. What is working in one country or on one continent can be compared to others because there's standardization across um, methodologies of data collection. So we can work intercontinental and cross-continental um, with collaborative partners. Um, for example, you have um, uh, snow leopard researchers working with tiger leopards, <laughs> working with lions um, across the globe and with shared and standardized data collection, you can have a collective co uh, conversation about what um, essential management and mitigation methodologies are um, working in some areas, not working in others, so there's shared lessons learned and a, a valuable network uh, to be created um, around that conversation. Also data, fundamentally, as we've seen, there's a gap in funding. So it enables us to prioritize where our limited funding should be placed. Where are the critical areas? Where can we make the greatest impact potentially in the shortest amount of time? What time, time and resources and funding is it going to take to actually create a positive outcome? And then data, first of all, you have your baseline to make those strategic planning decisions about where you're going to actually undertake research activities. But secondary, we need data to monitor and evaluate our efforts and strategies. And this is fundamentally important because we need to know um, if we're actually being successful with the activities that we're undertaking, both in our reporting, but also the fact that we're looking to grow our species populations, we're looking to reverse um, damage we've done to landscapes and different habitats. And without data, we can't determine whether we've fundamentally been successful um, with that. And then also determining which of our practices have worked best and then move and carry those forward as well. So data is used both to create policy change, to create an understanding of complex systems, to look at fundamentally where we need to place conservation efforts and resources, as well as being able to determine um, and monitor and evaluate our strategies for um, success moving forward. Thank you so much. That, that's very um, encouraging. Um, and it's also a good segue. I've got plenty of questions, but I don't want to hog, hog the, the, the limelight. And I know that we've, we've had some questions. Um, one by Simon, actually, there were kind of two by Simon. We're, we're talking a lot about policy change. And I was a um, um, policy influencer in my prior life, so it maybe also talks to me. But um, can, can games uh, help with policy change uh, for real, uh, you know, uh, regulatory law or or just mobilization etc now uh louisa you can jump in or, or basically uh, anybody can jump in i also want to encourage the panel now you've heard a lot you've some of you i can tell are, are monitoring the chat so if you want to um jump in please do and, and talk to uh, each other and, and questions that you've seen in the chat directly alpha you've unmuted yeah no it's a regulatory thing actually one of the uh, foundations i'm i'm uh, talking with here in la is kiss the ground i don't i don't know if you've seen their tremendous uh, documentary on the power of regenerative agriculture so the games we're developing are around that there's a biodiversity component and there's a regenerative ag component and so uh, we're looking at the 2023 20, uh, farm bill uh, to influence that and so i'm letting them do the influencing but i'm hopefully providing them with the, with a platform to uh, raise awareness around the importance of regenerative agriculture. As you know, there's there's a lot of problems with our what, how how we how we grow food in, uh, 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 around the world and and in the U.S. particularly. And so we're um, uh, partnering with them on using the awareness around uh, a regenerative agriculture to hopefully influence some of that. So I think yes, I think I think there's and using mass culture. You know, one of the things I've I've been uh, trying to do through through Bioman specifically is come up with stories that help us understand our, our relationship with nature. I noticed there was a there was a, there was a question about uh, will will games get people more uh, uh, disconnected from uh, real real life? And I think yes and no. But the, the games that we're developing actually have a uh, on the roadmap is that we you know we have to kind of uh, meet gamers where they're at, and so they're playing on mobile devices. And so Pokemon Go is a great example of where a mobile device can connect someone. 
to the real world and get them out in the real world. And so the games where uh, developing on the roadmap is this idea of, of uh, 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 getting people using augmented reality, using uh, uh, location-based gaming to get kids out and uh, gamers out into the real world, <coughs> interacting with the real world. And hopefully one of the things I wanna do is use the games to uh, help people imagine near uh, a greener planet for ourselves. And so you, you can imagine a Pokemon Go type game where you go into an environment, you uh, greenify that environment, and then you come together uh, uh, in the real world to make that vision a reality. So games can become an imagineering tool uh, as well. And so that's something that we have, we, we're, something I'm concerned about and uh, because I don't want kids in their devices, I want them out in the real world. And nature is, is a very healing thing. We've got a mental health crisis right now and nature is, is proven to be efficacious against, uh, against that. So, so yes, so that, that was just a question that popped up. And then one thing I did want to, there's been a number of questions as well around uh, blockchain and uh, NFTs and energy usage. And, you know, the, uh, yes and no, again, uh, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they use proof of work. It's very energy uh, uh, consuming. So absolutely, yes, we have to be concerned about that. But there, there are new protocols uh, coming out. Uh, I'm, I'm talking with the team at uh, Solana, for example. There are... Uh, you know, it gets very technical about why some protocols consume energy and others don't, but they have a low energy, you know, similar to what a, a Twitter tweet would be. So if you're, if, you're, if you're happy with Twitter, then, you know, you should be happy with uh, where NFTs is going. So, so currently, the most of the NFTs are, are uh, minted on Ethereum, but there are other, other protocols. Solana, I think, is, is one of the, the main contenders to uh, uh, provide a, uh, a low, low carbon footprint alternative. Uh, to to Ethereum, so so I just wanted to uh, address that question, which was which. Was Great, I'm I, I I see a lot of questions on on that, and in that half hour, I sort of had already imagined this would be the case. So I think we'll probably um, there's some people I know in the participants who who are working on NFTs or or interested. I'll, I'll I'll bring some of those up. It doesn't mean we're not talking about NFTs for the next 15 minutes, but I'll. Uh, just for those who ask the questions, I'm not ignoring, but I I think we'll we'll make some space for that. I, I see a great question from Elena, but just I, I wanted to squeeze one of mine in again, sorry, um, just to be a little bit provocative. Um, and I have somebody in mind who can maybe uh, answer this question, but I, I don't want to I want to throw this out to everybody. I want to see if we can get a reaction uh, from some of you, including in the chat, by the way, if you feel uh, strongly about this on the potential for gambling. In a way, if you look at it, gambling is 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 a form of of uh, of gaming. Um, the global online gambling market is about sixty seven billion and is predicted to go by ten percent uh, this year already. Is it okay uh, for conservation to tap into this uh, quite lucrative market, or are there hazards? Yes, Sasha, I was looking at you, but <laughs> I, mean, uh, <laughs> I, did, I did see Alex unmuted as well, so I don't know if you uh, wanted to go first, Alex. Go for it. Okay. Go for it, Sasha. Okay. So, yes, um, I think gambling is a contentious issue. My natural stance, um, which may go against what some people think, but naturally I think it should be avoided for ethical and practical reasons. Um, in my mind as conservationists, we should be setting the highest standards regarding how the public view nature um, and if we are commodifying nature and to the outside world exploiting nature using gambling mechanisms, then I think we risk a reputational damage to the sector and potentially to the way that uh, society view nature. But with that being said, I'm aware it's not black and white. I know we've discussed in the past, Adrian, that lotteries are a form of gambling. People seem to be okay with lotteries. They're already used in conservation. Um, so there may be a way of infiltrating that gambling sector, which don't um, elicit those very negative reactions and or manipulate people uh, or form addictions or things like that. Um, but from a practical perspective, uh, not just the ethical, the examples I've seen in the past are that they seem to be more of a fad. They seem to be a quick money-making kind of engagement moment, and then they die out again. And I think, again, if we're looking to revolutionize things, 
I, I can't yet see how gambling could be used to really revolutionize things in a very positive way, but that's not to say it can't be done. Um, but I think a lot of thought needs to be put into it to see how we don't have those negative ramifications on social beliefs, ethics, reputations. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite risk averse though, as I've already said. So yeah, but Alex, I'll throw it back to you then. Go for it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. great. It's already spawned a great debate in the chat, um, uh, precisely. And yeah, go on, Alex. Yeah, I, I think I think one of the key things that stood out to to me, Sasha, there was damage to, to to the industry, and I think there's absolutely a, a potential for that. What I'm going to talk about is specific to to gamification and and nudging and nudges. Now, um, there's a behavioral economist called uh, Cass Sunstein, and he talks about some really key fundamentals of when we use nudges and, and, and what they can be used for. Now, just to give a, a very, very brief example of a nudge, a nudge is when I'm walking into the shopping center and I'm looking and at eye level, I have got candy bars and, and those sorts of things at the checkout. Now that is a nudge. It's not telling me I have to do it. I don't have, I can choose not to, but it's there for a reason. There's a, there's psychology behind why we have candy bars and, and ends of, of the aisle. It's, it's, there's, there's purpose and psychology behind it. So that, that's, a, that's a nudge. Now, nudges need to be, need to be clear. It, it needs to be transparent. It needs to ideally not pull away from the, the individual's core personal beliefs. As soon as we start to pull away from that, we're, we're, we're in this, this gray space and, and really we're not necessarily engaging in positive gamification then because gamification, uh, that there is a positivity to it. We are trying to change behavior for the better. And we're trying to, to use mechanics and, and dynamics that, that we find in games, which is really exciting. We all love them, but we wanna make sure that it's, it's for good at the end of the day. Uh, so my personal opinion is if, is if we start using things like that that uh, you know, we want to use in a really positive light, and we start using that for something like gambling, I think there's a lot of potential negative consequences that can arise from that. Very divisive, uh, it's great. Uh, the, the poll actually, I, I don't have it on, I think it closed it, but it was also, as I saw it populated, was, was quite divisive. There's uh, discussions about actual sort of behavior change. There's points that are made that lotteries um, do a lot of what taxes do in, in developed country in developing countries and actually I know even in Switzerland it's it's a lot for culture etc so I don't want to dwell on this but if Louisa and Alfie you want to voice an opinion um now's now's good yeah I, I think you know I think there was a, a comment about ideology versus pragmatics and I think you know if money has been generated uh uh legally uh Actually, uh, Lynn, uh, I think it was Lynn Twist, she was saying, she calls it uh, holy money laundering. And I think, you know, money is money and impact is impact. So how you source that, you know, and it is, it, it is, you know, it is a divisive, it is a, because one of the things where I'm relying on is, is the, uh, this idea of oxytocin, you know, I want people to, when they, uh, and when your values are aligned, when your values of your product are aligned with the values of the consumer, you get, you get oxytocin, people fall in love and so what you don't want to do, you know, I'm not going to get into gambling, but if, if someone from Vegas wants to get, they're already doing it, but they want to channel some of that revenue into conservation. I'm like, hey, you know, take it. I mean, you know, we need all the money we can get, right? And so uh, we have to be careful that that uh, the uh, uh, we're doing it in a way that is uh, fair and ethical and legal. But, you know, I think, you know, we, you know we've got this huge funding gap. I, I don't necessarily... You know, and again, I'm using Lynn Twist's uh, phrase, holy money laundering. I, I think, you know, we can, we could, we could uh, take this money that has been maybe tainted, but we can use it for, for good. I don't know if that's, you know, the wrong thing, but hey, you know, I'm like, you know, we, we're, we're desperate, you know, we need uh, as much revenue as we can and in, 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 get it into the uh, conservation system. So those are my two cents on that. Louisa wants to jump, go for it. Well, Adrian, I think I'm definitely more aligned with Sasha um, from the perspective, as Alex said, from behavioral change. And I don't know if it's just my impression of gambling, but it seems that it needs to have fast iterations, continuous changes, maybe constant updates um, and a constant flood of, of information and add-ons um, and maybe even in-purchase uh, in purchase. Um, components that are rapidly changing and evolving and 
for me, fundamentally, is there behavioral change, therefore, that's happening within that um, space? Is it allowing people to really connect with nature and wildlife to create the long term change um, that we need to see? And so I think that is the, for me, the question between um, what we would create from a gambling perspective um, and the product that's created for that rather than a creation um, within a different space, such as Alex has talked to more about Pokemon Go um, and a, an interactive um, application along along those lines. So I think that's uh, that's my input on that. Yeah, thanks for thanks for pointing that out. There's really great. I, I can't obviously read it all, but I, there's really great points being made in the chat box too. So we'll we'll make sure that people can can see that at least people participate and we'll certainly uh, look at it. In my mind, also, it's you know where do you draw the line? Some people point to to stock markets. Um, you know, if you actually look at NFTs, what motivates people from buying NFTs? Often, it's it's you know the gambling element of maybe this will be worth ten times what it what it what it's worth now today. So it's also a question of that. But I think it's really important to see the question both in terms of funding and, and behavioral um, change. And thanks for, for doing that. I don't know if we're going to have more than time for more than one question. I'll, I'll go to a question by Elena that I, that I, I think it wraps up neatly as well things. Um, it says, this is very exciting, yes. Um, I'd be very interested in seeing where the point of entry is for nonprofit organizations and opportunities to combine efforts with others. One of the biggest issues in the traditional funding world is the competition between organizations for the same pot of funding. Um, I'm adding my own line, but yes, it would be good if we could expand that, that, that pot of funding. Would be a big positive news if new avenues remove some of that. That's probably not phrased quite well, but essentially it says, or is it up to each organization to explore this themselves? And I know I think it was Alfie who mentioned a, a community or I forget what the words were. Um, but if if there are reflections on that, is 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 the green jam the way to go? Are there nascent communities? Um, what, what are what are people's feelings? Because I, I suspect the answer can't possibly be everybody. It's a free for all. Everybody figure it out themselves. What are the good entry points for those who are interested, so they don't have to start from I, scratch? I might jump in there, and go I'm it. gonna I'm gonna throw Louisa under the bus because we had a, a wonderful conversation for this report. And I think Louisa has wonderful things to say, <laughs> but I will, just, I will just preface it with that local community, I think should and can have a very large impact on this. Now, if we are centralizing funding and then some, you know, trying to distribute it ourselves, that, that can cause issues that we might have blinders on and not see some really cool communities that really are doing a lot on the ground, need the funding and not getting access to it. Um, I think just from, from the conversations that I've had with Louisa, and I'm gonna pass it over to you in a second here with this, is that you've worked a lot with local communities on the ground, collecting the data and, and, and understanding, uh, I suppose, what is needed at, at that ground level. Do, do you have any more to, to give on that? Thanks, Alex. Yes, absolutely. I mean fundamentally if the funds don't return to the communities to where they're absolutely essentially needed then conservation action will not happen it won't happen at the community level it won't happen at the regional or national international level money has to flow down to where the uh, huge and diverse challenges of wildlife and um, challenges in climate change and, cl and challenges across um, a disintegration of ecosystem services are taking place and that is with at the heart local communities but also local government as well who we know um, not always have the a huge amount of funding and resources um, available particularly across developing countries and so supporting um, in situ community driven conservation initiatives is essential but getting funding from a large international organization and filtering it down to those on the ground you're quite right it is um, a big challenge that needs to be resolved and whether um, local communities and NGOs can come together and form co uh, cooperatives and collectives and collaborate under a singular umbrella to be a stronger entity to then um, go and apply for funding towards the the entity that is holding the gamification funds um, is a, a stronger way to apply. Um, there's also strength in collaboration and also ensuring that you're not getting duplication of effort of activities and you're fully utilizing the funds across a wide um, and diverse landscape and, and community stakeholder members. Um, so there's there's lots of um, ways um, to, to look at resolving that challenge, but 
it's fundamentally important that the money and the majority of the money filters down. And this is also what's going to be expected by the person who plays the game, who is involved at the community level, um, particularly um, your uh, very savvy um, new generation um, of young um, leaders and, and people across the world. They want to know where even their $5 are being spent, how much of that money is going to actually maintaining that piece of rainforest, that supporting that community development program, making sure that there's clean water. If you're spending $4.50 on administration or um, overheads and 50 cents is going back down to the community to support those programs, that fundamentally will not um, be viable to them. They want to know that the majority of their funds is going direct for impact and change. Um, so that's when ensuring that you've got collaborative community-based projects, you've got this umbrella of NGOs and locally-based organizations aligned with government, there's power in that and in collective stakeholder groups to drive change forward to utilize the funds effectively. Great, thank you. And I would um, venture to say also when, it, when, when these games are being designed and, and the business models behind them, um, I would, I would think, I would hope that the local communities uh, would be involved in that as well, and that that would probably be a challenge. Um, it certainly can't be an afterthought. It's an important point. So, Alfie, you had unmuted in the beginning. Do you want to? Yeah, one of the things we're looking to do through the games is form community. Already within the NFT world, there are communities forming, maybe mainly on Discord, mainly in the in the cloud. But we're, we're uh, looking to activate communities to come together in the real world and. And one of the things I'm, I'm looking to promote uh, through the games and, and through the TV series is, you know, through partnerships with people like Kiss the Ground, is promoting things like climate victory gardens, uh, getting people reconnected with the land, growing their own food, coming together as a community, as we used to, uh, to, to, to grow food uh, together again. And so that's something that I think games can do. It can inspire uh, uh, behaviors. Uh, and people, we're already seeing, actually, I was just reading an article the other day about how uh, because of COVID, people are, are uh, buying more house plants and stuff. And so that's a small little nudge, a green nudge for people to reconnect with plants. And I think, you know, if we can do that using games, nature is healing. You know, if we can reconnect with the land, we can, we can solve so many problems through games if we're smart about it. We can cause more problems, but I think if we're smart about it, we, we can actually solve a lot of these systemic issues because we've got like, uh, was it close to what, 3 billion gamers or something out there now? That's a lot of uh, little micro actions every day. That's a lot of impact we can have at scale and, you know, uh, 3 billion, you know, a buck each. Uh, yeah, so, you know, th there's a lot I think we can do. And we're, we're just at the cusp now of, of gamification for, for impact and conservation specifically, yeah. Adrian, can I, can I just add on, on what Alfie has just said, because I think it's, it's really important to pick that up, that the, the money that is, goes to the community through the storytelling and the progress that the communities can, are making then feeds back to the customer and they can get real time direct stories and um, uh, of success, of development, of growth, of innovation. Um, and um, then that will encourage them to continue to support. So that it's really important um, feedback cycle that is there. So it's not only about ensuring that the funding comes down to the communities, but also ensuring that feedback and um, you know the powers and success stories are coming back up to support continued support of the projects and programs. And, and um, as Alfie said, connecting with the community that's then fed back through Instagram. And that creates then a bigger audience because more people are drawn in to the success story. So you're, you're, um, you just expand and expand and, and that's hopefully how we then generate more income. Great, that's a wonderful way to wrap it up. Uh, just ahead of the hour, that was really fascinating uh, for me. I'm a little bit biased. I love this topic. Thank you so much for for uh, agreeing to this to this debate, no matter how early or how late it is. I see Alfie. The sun does seem to have risen over the horizon. Your your light is more um, lit up. Um, this concludes the formal part of the the panel. I want to thank everybody. We're going to stop the recording.